Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. My name is Mary Hartman. I'm Director of Education here at Bard on the Beach. And I'm delighted to welcome you to this year's forum. But before I do, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that we are gathering on the traditional territory of the Coast Salish people, including the territories of the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the tsleil nations. We are so grateful to be able to have our festival and do the work we do here in this magnificent place. And we are honored to be a part of the tradition that lives here. Uh, I am so pleased. I actually have a couple of announcements before we get to the fun part of introducing uh, our guests this evening. I would like to take a moment to acknowledge and thank the season sponsors for Bard's 30th season, and that is Newmont Gold Corp and the Peter and Joanne Brown Family Foundation. I also want to have a special shout out to our members. I know for a fact that we've got some members of many, many, many years standing here this evening. And we also have some new members here. We are so grateful for your support. It makes all the difference to us. So thank you all. of pragmatic things this evening. You may have noticed we do have some video cameras here. We have guests here this evening from, let me see if I can get the letters right, CJSF. Did I do that right? CJSF, 90.1 uh, FM at Simon Fraser University. Oh, I did it right, yes, uh, at Simon Fraser University. And they uh, are creating this amazing series, uh, and we are part of it. So, if you have any questions about that, about filming or any requests regarding not having your image, and I don't think anybody will be in it except for our panel, but if you have any concerns about it, just let us know. Uh, and then, the other thing that is worth noting is we will probably hear strains of opera coming across the way from the uh, UBC opera uh, performance that's happening on the BMO main stage this evening, and we're delighted about that. And perhaps it will entice you to go see one of the performances, which you could do on Monday, a week from today. There's a 2 p 2, 2 p.m. <laughs> and a 7.30 p.m. <laughs> Excellent. So. Uh, we're very informal, but if you think your phone might go off and embarrass you, now's a good time to silence it and make sure it doesn't. Um, and uh, I think that's all of the pragmatic stuff. OK, so now I am delighted. Oh, actually, one other thing. Uh, after about 45 minutes, we're going to have some questions and stuff like that. So uh, wait for me with the mic. I'll be running around with that. Oh, and when we leave, the UBC Opera performance will still be going on. So just don't whoop it up in the village. <laughs> I'm sure that they will drown out the conversations that we may have, but let's just not, let's not be too unruly, too boisterous. Um, yes. OK. <laughs> All right, so I am delighted to introduce someone who is new to us at Bard, and that is University of British Columbia Professor of English and current head of the Department of English Language and Literature, Patricia Badir, who flew here from Edmonton this evening and is getting right back on the plane to fly back, and we are <laughs> And I'm delighted to turn it over to you, Patsy. Okay, I'm going to stand up. Thank you, Mary. It's a pleasure to be here uh, this evening. This is uh, one of my favorite things to do. Um, okay, so we're here to talk about Kate. Uh, victor or victim uh, is the is the topic that we're we're here to discuss today. So most of you will already know that the Taming of the Shrew is uh, no stranger to controversy, right? This is a play that features a complicated heroine, Katerina Manola, who, like many of Shakespeare's comic heroines, is of strong opinions, right? And even stronger will. She's like Beatrice or Viola or Rosalind. A character whose wit and determination uh, shapes the plot of the, play, of the play that she finds herself in. 
And like so many of these heroines, she is at odds with both her family and her community. Um, one of the things that we simply can't contest is that in Shakespeare's day, women were told to be chaste, silent, and obedient. And Katerina is um, at least neither silent nor obedient. Um, any, uh, any power that Shakespeare's outspoken women uh, wield is always subject to the limitations of the patriarchal society that they inhabit. But in many of Shakespeare's great comedies and in some of his tragedies, too, we find, um, we find all kinds of, of powerful women who challenge uh, the expectations um, of, of their worlds and find really creative ways to undermine the authorities that attempt to control their actions and their lives. But The Taming of the Shrew, unlike Much Ado About Nothing or Twelfth Night or As You Like It, also features this very, very powerful and very controversial male character, Petruchio, whom he calls Kate, and who is harsh with her at best, and, and some would go so far as calling him misogynist. So the real question, and I'm not going to talk for very long here, the real question for us and for anyone who interprets this play is, is how are we supposed to read a character like Katerina? Is she the victim of a culture who thinks it's OK to tame noisy women? Or does Shakespeare use her as a, as a kind of warrior to critique the social structures that she finds herself in? So the play takes us to the very heart of the relationship between Katerina and Petruchio and asks us what to make of them, particularly what to make of Katerina. Is she a victim or is she a victor? So those are the questions that we're going to take up today. And uh, I'm going to turn to, to our, our panel to help answer these questions. But first of all, I'm going to introduce, introduce them to you. So uh, we have Paul Boudra here, who many of you know because he's, 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 he appears on this stage often to discuss these things, from Simon Fraser University, professor of English. Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> Woo! And two other people who know this play from performing it, from performing it many times, we have Lois Anderson, who's the director of the production of Taming the Street. And Jennifer Lines, who is Katerina. So <laughs> My first question I'm going to address to Paul, yes. um, and, my qu and what I'd like you to do is, is maybe uh, familiarize our audience with um, some of the reasons why scholars have problems with this play. Okay. Uh, at first, they didn't, apparently. When this play was first performed, it seems it was very popular. Uh, it's quoted, and it's one of the few Shakespeare plays which generated a response play. Uh, John Fletcher, another playwright, uh, a man with whom Shakespeare worked on his play, Henry VIII, uh, wrote a play called The Tamer Tamed as a response to Taming of the Shrew. And you don't do that unless people know the original play. So it was popular. It was popular in the 18th century, although it was cut down by David Garrick and ch the changed to Catherine and Petruchio, sort of got rid of the, uh, the other sort of subplots in it. And it's, it, it's, it was popular in the 19th century, too, where the original version was restored. When it starts to become really problematic is, not surprisingly, in the 20th century, uh, when, uh, especially when we get into the 1960s and 1970s. And in 1975, there was one of the first pieces of significant um, uh, f feminist criticism of Shakespeare uh, emerged called Shakespeare and the Nature of Women. And that sort of opened an avalanche of uh, reassessments of this play and other plays in which uh, a variety of critics asked the questions. Well, they, they did it this way. They looked at Shakespeare and said, Shakespeare is put forward as the, the, uh, the articulator of universal values. And these critics said, what you're calling universal values is just white male values. And there's a whole other voice here, which is, being marginalized, and these critics began to tear these plays apart and say, was Shakespeare a misogynist? Was Shakespeare complicit in the ideology of his time? Or if we dig down, can we see him subverting it? Can we, as, as Patsy suggested, find points of resistance? And it hasn't been settled. It's still going on. But this play, a play in which a woman is starved, sleep-deprived, <laughs> thrown in the mud, 
and then made to publicly declare her, her subservience to her husband might be a little problematic. <laughs> Especially, and I'm interested in Lois's take on this, in the post hashtag Me Too movement. I mean, in the past three years, the world has changed around these issues. And to do this play right now strikes me as very brave. So that's a cue to turn to Lois. <laughs> so, why were you interested in remounting this production in the wake of hashtag Me Too? Right, well, I didn't, okay, so first of all, it was actually Christopher who wanted to remount it. <laughs> which I, I think is, um, and so when it came to me as a, as a possible, uh, there was a question of whether, of who might want to direct uh, a taming right now, mm -hmm. and he wanted to uh, uh, attempt another taming, which I think it's it was time to to do that. And I felt very strongly that a, a woman should try to attempt a production of Taming of the Shrew. And so I thought, well, I, this would be a really exciting challenge to uh, to to see how we could crack into it and what we could discover. Um, and how we could present it. And, you know, the hashtag Me Too era that we're in, uh, for me, very much was about um, the visibility of women, uh, hearing women and uh, bringing them from an invisible place to a place of visibility. And uh, so that became sort of the focus of the production, was how to make Kate visible. And it's it's interesting though, because I'm not sure that Kate, that Shakespeare made her invisible, because she's quite visible, <laughs> <laughs> and she has a fantastic monologue. She ends the play, and she is the most articulate person in the room. So e apart from this production, and I, I've played Kate, and I have done that monologue straight up as a as a genuine uh, committing, unlike what. A, gen Jen had to, you know, turn it upside down. But it, it is an incredible feeling to not have lines for hours and suddenly end with the monologue. And you do feel, as an actor, the power of language. Shakespeare has given her, um, it's about two pages of, 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 of text. So it doesn't necessarily feel as if she's sub, sub, subverted there because of the amount of text she has at that moment. And uh, so it's, it's interesting that way. There's something powerful that he was doing by uh, giving her a monologue. No silence. And everyone's listening. Yeah. I mean, it, it, you know, when you make a choice of, of how you play it. Mm -hmm. I never felt that I was oppressed when I, when I, when I gave that monologue sincerely in the last production that we did here at Bard prior to this. I never felt that she was, um, I felt that she was articulating love and making her partner a king, as we do when we're in love. She was raising up her lover to be the king that she would, and she would do anything for him and hopefully he would do the same for her. That's, that's how I found my way through doing it straight up. And it worked. I don't know if anyone saw that, <laughs> but it did. It worked. Uh, you yeah. felt. Uh, you uh, did. You not. You know. You felt it was a lo uh, a love monologue, not an oppressed woman. Jennifer, <laughs> 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 what do you? How do you feel about this play right now? Well, it's not the play that I'm doing. <laughs> at um, at Bard. So I I am detached from this play that we're talking about today. Mm -hmm. And it is very disturbing to me. I could not responsibly say, your husband is your lord, your king, your sovereign, your, you know, uh, all those things that are, that place me subservient to a man responsibly as a woman in this day and age. So I have a lot of trouble with this, uh, a straight up version of this. It's, it doesn't feel responsible for, for me to say that. What we did is something much, much different. And we really did try to take out 
gaslighting, misogyny. We took out a lot of, we took out the street scene where he says, um, kiss me, Kate, and she says, no, I'm ashamed to kiss in the street. We took, that's just gone. We started kissing in the camp <laughs> and got right to it. And then there was an ally. And we also switched the antagonist uh, of Petruchio was not my antagonist in our production. The, the town was my antagonist that bullied me and he became an ally. So the, the version we're doing, I feel like a thousand percent so joyful to do. This, this is, there's so many complicated... Um, uh, Moments. Moments of subservience and obedience. It's just the word obedience is, is just peppered through everything in this play. It's difficult. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult to do. Okay, so let's get specific about the direction then of, of mm. this production and, and move away from the play for a minute. We'll come back to it, but uh, move away from the text itself. Uh, for me, one of the really significant choices about the production is, is the degree to which um, Kate becomes or is presented as ostracized by the community. So, so you know, it begins with, with the whole town going, shro, 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 you know, and, and you get the sense of her as... Um, that her victimization is coming from somewhere else, and 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 Petruchio is in fact an ally, rather than uh, the 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 enemies or, or the townspeople. And so I'm wondering if all of you could could comment on some of the specific directing choices and the changes that you needed to make to this play to make it um, work for a 21st century audience in Vancouver. Well, the, the first question was, uh, who is calling her a shrew? Why is she called shrew? Is it because she actually is a shrew or because she's, uh, who, where did that name come from? So that was sort of the beginning point of uh, who was the antagonist. Mm -hmm. that, that led to the town becoming the antagonist. If she's not actually a shrew, but she's different and has been a different person, different than the status quo throughout her life and her growing up, then we tend to point at difference uh, and sometimes call, you know, witch, witch, witch. Mm -hmm. So that led quite quick, quite quickly it bubbled up who the antagonist could be. And it released the antagonist from being, Petruchio from being the antagonist. Mm -hmm. And once we released Petruchio from being the antagonist, who was he? He immediately became an ally, mm -hmm. which is what you're describing. So it was a need to figure out why, well, where's the, where does the word come from? Where does the, the title come from, shrew? And then, as we discovered in rehearsal, where is the moment where she titles herself? Where, where is the moment where she says, I'm not going to be called Shrew anymore. My name is Kate. I am naming myself. This is my name. This is who you, this is who I am. This is my identity, which is also part of the hashtag Me Too era uh, uh, that we wanted to create a sense that she could define her identity. Would you, would you agree with that? Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and even uh, uh, they call me Shrew that do talk of me. They call me Kate that do talk of me. We s switched that at the very, at the ninth, the end hour kind yeah. of thing, just to reiterate that she takes it on too. When someone calls you that enough, you just live in that and you thrive on being vicious and. Mm -hmm. And no one can stand up to you anymore until this guy shows up and is relentless with compliment, relentless with delight in you. And it's, it's absolutely unnerving. So we worked on love, like love, <laughs> for, for Petruchio and Kate. And that really set a lot of it free from misogyny and gaslighting for him. And I tell you, I could switch as much as I want anything in this show, but nothing would work if we don't change the men around the women and how they behave to us and uh, what their intentions are. And Andrew, mm -hmm. in our production, really, McNee took the lead on uh, carving out a Petruchio that cared mm -hmm. so that Kate could just become herself, which is what we were trying to find in this, where she just didn't have to be the mayor's wife, the good wife, the pretty girl, the servant, the whatever you have, those little roles that she c could only be. And he allowed her to be who she wants to be, make her choices herself. So she, Kate deeply falls in love with him. It's easy when someone sees you, and he's the first that says, I see you. I see your beauty. Mm -hmm. 
So that's what we were playing on. Yeah, this, that's interesting, but it, 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 I, I would argue it rewrites the play. It does. Uh, for yeah. example, we, uh, we did rewrite the play. We did. I know. <laughs> I, I, I would like to talk about that too. <laughs> but just just two things that the, from what both of you have said. First of all, uh, you know, uh, calling yourself Kate and being Kate. But in fact, the first time Petruccio and, and Kate meet. Uh, Drew says, hi, Kate. And she says, no, my name is Catherine. Yes. And he immediately says, no, you're Kate, you're Kate, you're Kate, you're sweet Kate, you're Kate of Kate Hall. And he, he rewrites her. Yeah. He says, you don't get to claim your name. I'm yeah. imposing a name yes. on well, you. Yes, that we is switched yes, that. that. We just switched <laughs> that. I mean, if, if you, you don't mind. If, okay. Yeah. If we, because, exactly, because yeah. we were going a different direction. I thought, yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, okay, and I mean you can do it like that if you want to, Paul. I, I mean, <laughs> I'm... I'm well, and, and uh, I, loved, I loved the performance of Petruccio. I thought it was great, and, and, and he, he had that warmth. But I'll just point out, through most of the 19th century, uh, there was a tradition of the actor playing Petruccio to, to carry a whip on stage. Actually, Jen was practicing her bull whip, weren't you? Yeah. That almost came on stage. A, re a real um, reversal. One of the lines that uh, pulled out really early on for Petruccio was when he says, and therefore, let's frolic. And that, that was actually the building block for Petruchio. And therefore, let's frolic. Playful. If that's his value. That's the value he offers. Let, yes, playfulness. So we, we, and then we gave the line to Jen. <laughs> 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 we took the line. Uh, um, Andrew built his character around that value. Okay. That what he brings is playfulness and, and the trickster, as opposed to um, an overbearing um, misogyny. And so that actually unlocked Andrew. Andrew, when I first met him, said, I don't, I'm really terrified. I don't want, he wouldn't have taken the part if we, if we had to talk through it, just as Jen was saying, we met before they accepted the offers. And both of them were very clear, as myself as well, that we couldn't do the show as written. We would, someone else could do it. But, but we would we not wouldn't do it. No. And I remember going to even in the office with Rhea and Mary and um, Claire and reading that last monologue word for word very slowly and very clearly to them and saying, I, I cannot do this. And they said, you're going to meet with Lois and you're going to talk with her. She's got this idea. <laughs> 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 and Lois talked me through what we were going to do and finally got to the very end where the carpet gets pulled and I... What did I do? Well, Jen, um, <laughs> first of all, you got up and you started skipping in a circle, and, uh. and, and you started weeping, I and you yeah. sort of went around, skipping around the room, weeping, and said, I want to tell that story. That's what she said. I want to tell that story. I'm a feminist. I want to tell that story. And, when you, and that's when I knew we were on the right track, when, when your lead is saying, that's the story I want to, I want to tell. Because as actors, we must know why we're telling a story, and we must know what we're putting out there in the world. No longer are we just uh, taking a job uh, anymore. We'll do, we'll do something else. And we are not the only ones to adapt a Shakespeare. Like, no. it, there's no shame in, in doing what we've done, and I don't feel any yeah, so I have there. no apologies. <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid I have to set boundaries because I have to keep playing her. <laughs> I guess it's just, it's also infuriating, you know, to always have been put in your place, even as an actor on the stages, you know, and yeah. to have seen us all try to bend to Kate uh, to have some dignity. You know, we're learning, and we talked about this in the process, we're learning as female actors to demand um, visibility in, in the roles that we take. And this is, agency. This is part of the hashtag Me, Me Too era. As actors, we, if we're not visible, we don't just sign on anymore and just say, yeah, I'll carry a spear or I'll do whatever you want. Um, we're now demanding that we, 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 we know the story we're telling and that it's a story we want to tell and we interrogate it in the room. It's quite, to be in a rehearsal room right now with women and young women. Uh, I have to say it's the younger women that have brought just, that forward. It's like not doing it, and if I'm doing it, <laughs> if I'm doing it, I need to know why I'm doing it, or I don't want to do it. Wow. And so we, would, we don't take contracts anymore just for jobs. I think we've really passed that. Um, we'll do other things. 
But it's very important that we, uh, that we get behind the stories we're telling. Wouldn't you say? Yeah. It is, yes, yeah. <laughs> and I, I can clearly, uh, my opinion is, uh, yeah, she is a victim in, in Shakespeare's play because of the patriarchy. In ours, we, she is, I am not a victim. So that I can clearly feel mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. We changed no, the context. <laughs> change okay, well, um, I, I think it might be interesting in the light of this conversation to actually take a look at a few of the lines, some of the more um, troubling lines. When I teach this play, my students always gravitate to those lines and, and, and they want to know what to do with them. Um, my sense is, uh, is, is and, and, and I think it's quite wonderful that you have the, 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 the ability, the freedom, the willingness to, to play with those lines, to chuck them out if they can't be bent um, to your purpose. Uh, and I think that that's very much in keeping with the spirit of the way that Shakespeare wrote for the theater. Hmm. Um, but I'd like to talk about some of those those very lines. Um, most of them are Petruchio's. Um, <laughs> I wish he was here. <laughs> and and I, you know, I don't remember exactly what was done with each of them, although I do remember bits and pieces, so I'll come to my reactions in a second. But um, the first set of lines is from Act 3, Scene 2. Um, Petruchio's just married Kate, and they're about to head off to the wedding dinner, but Petruchio announces that he wants to leave um, before before the, the end of the ceremonies. And, and Katarina states this would be rude and that she'd rather stay, um, but he simply overrules her and the scene ends with these lines. Um, sometimes they're delivered with the rest of the actors on stage and sometimes um, he delivers them directly to the audience. I will be the master of what is mine own. She is my goods, my chattels. She is my house, my household stuff, my field, my barn, my horse, my ox, my ass, my anything. <laughs> Paul, why don't you start talking about that? <laughs> I feel I'm being set up somehow. I don't know. What I'm doing. But, uh, you know, you just, it's just, there's three women with you. Yeah. Yes. Like, yeah. Um, legally. <laughs> It's true. He's right. Yeah, yeah. In 16th century England, yeah. what he's stating is a legal fact yeah. that women were. I think that was up to the 1970s. <laughs> possibly. Um, and so what he's saying, which we, you know, of course, we just go, whoa. <laughs> um, probably his audience would not have blinked at this because well this is this is common sense this is this is natural law that this is how it works uh, and it's it, interesting that he says it at that moment because I think the way you get around it being so awful is he says it so that he can mock protect her and get her away from the family because she doesn't want to leave. So he says, no, this is my property. Back, back, everyone. I will take my property and go. So he says this thing, which to us is horrible, but then he sort of turns it around a bit. And so I think that's how it gets incorporated. Oh. Yeah, no, it's difficult. But uh, in yeah, I can speak for ours. It, it, it doesn't land well when he says it. <laughs> <laughs> and I think he feels badly after it spews out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and that's kind of our Petruchio. It, he's trying to be in earnest in saying these things. And then <laughs> I am, when he turns to me, he clearly knows he said the wrong thing. <laughs> <laughs> so we're kind of playing with that yeah. as best we can to let this play still survive somehow. Yeah and bend some of the other yeah. moments, but that's a toughie. Yeah, but I, I mean, mean that's ridiculous. I, 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 for Andrew, what he, when we discussed it, we, in, he's, put his, he's putting his focus on the town, yeah. and he's trying to do it in a way, wh what he's feeling is that he's just, it's spewing out of him because he's so angry at them. It's just come, if he actually took a moment to stop and think, he wouldn't say it like that. He's just losing it. Mm. And then he realizes what he's, you know, he, that was maybe not the best way to say it. He's put his foot in his mouth. As our Petruchio puts his foot in his mouth a lot. Yeah, yeah. it's great. <laughs> and we all know that. That's a very human, you know, condition in relationships that you're putting your foot in your mouth. So, uh, so that's how we took it. He's, it's, is it not okay to let the play be ugly from time to time? Yep. To make the audience feel, ew? Yeah? Yeah. Like, to have a yeah. moment, like, do exactly. we always have to feel yay Shakespeare? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, and so that's what we all feel. We go, yeah. oh, you just went too far, yeah. and yeah. do you really think? And he has a journey through it, too. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. So. yeah. 
he makes a, yeah, he says, a, uh, he, he makes many mistakes and yeah. we watch him make them yeah. as we all do. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that I thought was kind of funny about the, at least the way I felt that I was receiving those lines was I thought that this Petruchio really did love his house. <laughs> <laughs> but then you saw his so camp. Yeah. Kind of. There flat, was no right? house. But he loved his wife as much as he loved his house yeah. and his cow. Yeah. You know. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, that's great. No, I, <laughs> I do love my cow, and I love her too. I think that's in there, and I love that it ends with. I don't know if the last word is anything. She is my anything. She is my anything. I, yeah. it, it, it does. It does sound like I, she's everything to me, and I'm going to list all of my things. <laughs> Yeah, I think, I, I, I think it's thing. originally a statement of something positive. She's mine. Okay. <laughs> Should I get them to talk about some more lines? Yeah. yeah you okay, here's another one. Uh, so uh, this is from for, at four scene one. Um, Petruchio's taken uh, Kate home to where uh, to his house, and he has starved her and deprived her from sleep in order to bend uh, bend her to his will. So this is what he says. Um, Thus have I politically begun my reign. This is again at the end of the scene. Uh, uh, and tis my hope to end successfully. My falcon now is sharp and passing empty until she stoop, she must not be full gorged. That is all done in reverent care of her, and in conclusion she shall watch all night, and if she chance to not, I'll rail and brawl, and with the clamor keep her still awake. This is a way to kill a wife with kindness, and thus I'll curb her mad and headstrong humor. He that knows better how to tame a shrew, now let him speak, tis charity to show. <laughs> okay. Uh, there, there are two things going on in this. Uh, I'll do the historical perspective. There are two. That's good. <laughs> good. It's it. my, my safe playground. Um, so there's two things going on, and I talked about this in the Exploring Shakespeare lecture. First, uh, it's drawing on falconry. Um, and to, tra to train a falcon or a hawk, and the words uh, kite and haggard appear throughout the play, and they refer to birds. Uh, one of the things you did was you, 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 you had to stay awake with it on your arm. You'd sit there until the bird fell asleep on your arm, right? And then when the bird woke up and it realizes you're still there, it, it, this, this is your new reality. So this is part of taming a falcon. So that's one of the, why he's doing the sleep deprivation and talks about her as a falcon. He's, this is from fa birding. Uh, and the other word in there is, of course, humors, and the idea that the, the body has these different humors in it, and if they're out of balance, they create psychological and physiological problems. And the one that they're most worried about, the humor is collar. It makes people angry. So there are certain foods you can't eat. So we put you on a strict diet. We won't let you eat meat, right, to correct that balance. So on one hand, he's taming her like a wild animal. On the other hand, he is being sort of a physician of her to cure her psychological imbalance. So which one do you want to emphasize? Oh, she's my pet? Mind you, it's a, it's a badass pet, a falcon. <laughs> right, it's not a lap dog. Okay, this, this is a killer. Right, we're, we're hunting together. Uh, um, and then there's the medicinal side of it. Well, and luckily, um, because our Kate does not get tamed and in no way is tamed, Lois, in that scene, when Petruchio goes back to his house with her, gave me all the aggressive lines. In the original, Kate says nothing and is the taming begins, right. seriously. In ours, I come in screaming and yelling and telling everybody to take my boots off, feed me, give me food, I want the food, don't take the food, you know? And I exhaust myself. <laughs> <laughs> and then the boys all sing and share those lines about one other cowboy says, you know, I know how to tame a hawk. And the first line you said about, um, now have I po 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 politically begun my reign, he says that after I've torn the tent apart and says it quite ironically <laughs> because I've ripped the whole place <laughs> apart and he's failing very badly. <laughs> so we turn the whole scene uh, upside, down. upside down so that they're, they're, I, they're all impotent <laughs> to me, you know, in the sense of even attempting any taming, which leads us into that next scene where uh, co the, the clothing comes on because uh, Hortensio is going to be marry, marry that widow. And um, quite clearly, Petruchio 
knows that I'm not, I don't wear stuff that's fancy or anything, and this really fancy dress shows up. And through that scene, he and the tailor and the haberdasher make fun of Kate and call her a shrew. And I start to see that he is absolutely trying to protect me and let me be who I am and not have the city come in and um, belittle me again. And in that scene, I see, I feel this protection and love of the even Grumio is in on that and that these people will let me be, will just let me be and see me. And so we kind of turned all that taming around so that I had agency to love him for what he was doing for me, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so we did mm -hmm. switch all of that, mm -hmm. if I may. But it's horrible to do it the other way. You know. Well, I mean, I wonder, right? you know, I keep saying that, sorry. Paul's being all historical about this, but another historical tidbit that's kind of interesting is, um, is that in six, 16th and 17th century bestiaries, shrews were understood. Here, I'm going to read to you. Um, this is from Topsell's History of Four-Footed Beasts, published in 1607. So Topsell says that a shrew is a ravening beast, feigning itself to be gentle or tame. Feigning itself to be gentle and tame, but touched, it biteth deep and poisoneth deadly. So if this is what people thought shrews were in, in Shakespeare's time, then the truth is you can't tame a shrew. So there's a joke in the title of the that's play lovely. then, right? I like that. Well, that's really nice. Right? So, like so it makes me wonder, have you actually <laughs> tapped into what Shakespeare's trying to do here? Yes, if we if have. shrews are not tamed. That's <laughs> with all shape. Yeah, we haven't changed anything. <laughs> I mean, everybody argues it, but, but I it, think. But it, is, it is this interesting thing that, that this is an animal that was under Understood to be, you, you couldn't you couldn't tame a shrew. Mm -hmm. So, so well, and but when you said that you did that last monologue straight and you felt still empowered, mm -hmm. it's like she wins within the patriarchy in that way. Yeah, you know, it's a, it's this it, to, to do it the she straight re, way. Yeah. Well, she reintegrates. She reintegrates in into society. She, she, she yeah. they will join society, and as I guess most comedies end, it, there's a you know the society is whole, and they're part of society, and they'll have their celebrations together. She re-enters, but she's not silent. Not she's not yes, silent. Yes, exactly. She's so it's very strong, strong right. poetic voice. She's speaking the right words, but she's speaking them. It's not Patricio that's speaking yeah. them. She's speaking them. So yeah. that, I think there's a tension, an, she, an uncomfortable tension. And it's a very it. long monologue. Right? You, yeah, you, it I does. Mean, it will go on. It yeah. is cut. This is cut. And so you do have the sense when someone speaks that long, and when a character has that much, that they say it, but then they take more space and say more, and then they take more space. They keep taking yeah. space the longer they, they yeah. speak. So it's like saying, "I'm silent. I'm silent. Look, I'm really silent, and I'm keep telling you that yeah. I'm silent, and it's not." You know, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> weird. it's interesting. How are we doing for time? We're good. Okay, so well, can I ask about one more scene? Because um, uh -huh. this is a, the scene that I, can, I have so much trouble teaching and um, anything that you guys can uh, help me with here. Um, and that is uh, Act 4, Scene 5. It's the scene that everybody calls the moon and the sun scene. Um, oh. And it's, it's too long <laughs> to read out. But it's the scene uh, where Katerina and Patrika are on their way back to, um, uh, to the wedding. And uh, they've stopped. And uh, Petruchio begins by stating, oh, look, the moon shines bright. Brightly. And Kate, knowing full well that it's daylight, responds that it's the sun that's, that's shining brightly. And it goes on that way until he finally gets her to say whatever he wants her to say. Um, my students call it the gaslighting scene. Um, and uh, that's because Patri uh, Patricio does manage to move Kate, at least and it's, it looks in, in the text, that he manages to bring Kate to a position where what he thinks is what she thinks, and she can no longer think for herself. Um, so, so, but the thing about the scene that is uh, so frustrating is that it's also one of the funniest scenes that Shakespeare ever wrote, especially the bit when the old man comes in. Oh, and yeah. so, so it's a piece of brilliant dramaturgy um, and, and great comic writing, and yet it's in so many ways, at least from the text, a, a kind of horrifying thing. Mm -hmm. So thoughts. I think I think she has an opportunity to <clears throat> realize a couple things depending on how that scene is done. So we're doing it one way. Yes. But when I did it, 
I, I, I'm just saying there's multiple choices here. This is what actors do and, and with their directors. She realized that he was playing a game all the time, and she laughed at that moment and realized, this is a game, what you've been doing with me all along. And they la we, we laughed together, right there, right there. And, and then that the she, roles in society are a game. Yeah, so it was a, it's a funny scene, and she had, she, it's the first time in the play when she laughed. And so that's how we cracked that. And then they went forward uh, with, Humor and frolic and joy. That was that. That was it, that's one version. Um, she. I've also read. I think in Harold Bloom, where he suggests she learns how to manipulate him. There, she learns what. She learns how to go. Yeah. Okay. If I want to get what I want, I'll just say it's the sun. But I'm, I'll, ultimately, I'm going to get what I want. But I'll just. Okay, honey. I'll say that. But I'm really getting what I want. So that's another choice, and I've seen that. I think that Elizabeth Taylor kind of played that choice mm -hmm. in the film where you really feel like she knows how to play him because he just gave her the rule book. Mm -hmm. Agree with me, and then get... I agree with you, but I get whatever I want, actually, um, which is sneaky and tricky and also mm -hmm. funny. Um, what, what we did was we thought, how could we make this domestic, you know, when you're just arguing with your... Um, you know, and you're, it's always about something. No, that's, no, you just said, leave it on. No, I didn't. I said, leave it on. No, you said, leave it on. And you, you just have these ridiculous arguments. <laughs> very, very domestic. Right. So, they, so um, Jen and Andrew improved uh, um, the beginning yeah, of the scene. You gotta read the sign. We're on the wrong path. Direction. You didn't even read right? the sign. We've been going around and around. And he's like, that's a the old, old right. war sign. And yeah. anyway, it's ridiculous. Which is, you know, <laughs> it's like riding in the car with your, with your partner or anybody and you're arguing but no, take that route. No, that route doesn't. So they improv that. And we tried to make, when, we, when the Shakespeare dialogue started, uh, Lois kept telling us to stop. No, now it sounds like you're saying Shakespeare dialogue. I want that feeling to continue into that dialogue. And so we worked quite hard on making even the Shakespearean, I'd actually, it's probably prose there or verse. I'm not even quite sure. Yeah. At least seemed very uh, domestic. domestic. Yeah. And you said to me, uh, uh, okay, so you call that the moon, it, that's fine. What you call it, it will be. What I call it, it will be. <laughs> <laughs> so we kind of tried to find that take on that scene. Yeah. You go ahead, call it whatever you want, but I get to say exactly. And then you gave me Petruchio's lines. Yes, yes. right. Yeah. Yeah. That helped. Help so then I started the game <laughs> with the old man that yeah. entered and yeah. said, so if I say that is the son, are you with me here? And if I say this is a lady, are you with me here? And mm -hmm. he, he does. <gasps> Yeah. And then we're good. We're yeah. good. We're good yeah. to take on the whole world together. So what we wanted to do is sort of demystify the sun and the moon scene because it has so much attention oh. placed mm -hmm. on it. Mm -hmm. And the improv, uh, the fighting about directions, just allowed them to just start fighting about sun and moon. It, it lightened it up. It made it more, this is just what happens when you're fighting. You say these things and then you stick by them and you double down on them <laughs> just because you don't want to lose the fight. Because the sun and the moon scene has, is, it is... So so precious it's elevated as, yeah. as, as seen that people often talk about and we, we kind of wanted to yeah to lessen it a bit. and because we'd already got the win of love in the camp we didn't have to build up to the love in the next scene that was going to come kiss me now that you've agreed with me now yeah. kiss me in the street which is kind of the climactic point where you go oh okay then they go into that party mm -hmm. and you're not, you know, they're kind of in love. Mm -hmm. We brought it way earlier so that it could be domestic going in there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they've kissed, but they're still going to fight. We're going to fight the whole way. <laughs> I see skepticism. There's so we, we changed it, Paul. Yeah, no, I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed the production. I loved the, the interplay and I thought it very warm and loving. But there's another way to do it, which is equally feminist. Uh, and doesn't doesn't make those changes, and that is that uh, Kate is is the is the victim of domestic abuse, 
and she at that point is beyond exhausted, and she literally gives up. And it's, it's like the end of uh, Orwell's 1984, I love Big Brother. Whatever he tells me is my reality is now my reality. And I have seen a production uh, like that. It was about three years ago at Shakespeare's Globe. It was set in Ireland. And it was uh, the least funny production of Taming Shrew <laughs> anyone has ever done. I pity any young people that went there on a first date. <laughs> Well, I think that's the only that other way to do it, is yeah. that you either go there the or yeah. you get or, or set her free. <laughs> and, and was that Shakespeare's original intention? Well, this is, this and is like, the thing. What is, I, I think Shakespeare's audience, the, some of the stuff that we find domestic abuse, they literally would have found funny. Yeah. Because there are things like that, I, I talked about in, in my lecture, about the, the ballad of the shrewish wife who was wrapped in a horse's skin and beaten, which yeah. came out around the same time. This was a ballad. People were singing this. Oh, that bad shrewish wife. I'll wrap her in this horse hide and beat her with the rods. And now she's good. <laughs> Again, so romantic. Yeah. It's just, you know. Yeah. Um, a bit rough. <laughs> so that was sort of popular entertainment. And there's a whole tradition tradition of shrew literature and shrew jests from this period, which were considered funny. And, and shrew bridles. Yeah, and shrew, shrew bridles. This stuff was hysterical. So um, <laughs> we can't, we find it domestic abuse and awful, and, and like I said, well, that I production is powerful and terrible. But I think yeah, they, they wouldn't have had much of a problem with this. But do you think Shakespeare was writing a play that was... <sighs> Do you think he was writing a love story? Or do you think he was just taking the, the, the trope, I guess, the trope of the, the, you know, I always think of Punch and Judy, uh, and, and just doing that for a good old laugh because everyone knew we laugh at that. Or do you think he was taking it further and, like, do you think he was upgrading that a bit and creating a love story? Do you think originally it would have seemed a love story? I, I think, yeah, I think the, uh, and, and I, I remember seeing a production of Stratford upon Avon like 30 years ago or something, a very straight production. And I had the unfortunate uh, pleasure of being there on a high school afternoon as all the high school students were there. <laughs> right, but at, at the, they played it straight, played it romantic and loving. And when Kate came out at the end, when she's called, all these high school kids applauded. Like she did it. Because she was obedient. Yeah. And at the same time, they all choked up with her speech. OK, this was like in the early 90s, probably, or maybe in the 80s. Uh, so the long way of getting this is, yeah, I think it, it probably was done in a way that was considered romantic. And I think that last speech, even though we find it difficult for a lot of uh, Shakespeare's audience, they would say, well, yes, this is a family life. This means what peace and, and good you know, grace and whatever Petruchio says about the future marriage. Yeah, and Shakespeare love, is and Shakespeare's positive about marriages in his comedies. That's what they're all no, about. They're not. moving towards marriage. Yes. Yeah. No, they're um, complicated. Oh, uh, the planes and helicopters. All complicated. None of them is um, easy. We are allowed to celebrate them, but they're always complicated. I think this is a a, a play where where Shakespeare is actually working out. I mean, the the end result is let's make everybody laugh and let's let everybody go home happy. But at this, but but along that route, that we're going to stop and we're going to make things complicated for you. We're going to make you make as an audience and as actors a whole lot, of, or as as critics or readers or students, uh, a lot of of complex decisions about what's going on. And I think things like that final monologue. Um, or even moments where, uh, at the end of that bit in four one, that I, the bit with, that I just read to you about, about with, where Petruchio gives that speech, he turns to the audience and says, or he turns to other guys on the stage or to the audience, depending on the direction, and says, "If you can think of a better way to deal with this, then deal with it." And I think that that's it's kind of a question that that is being thrown out there. I don't know what to do yeah. here, and I think that the play is full of those "I don't know what to do here" moments, and that final monologue feels that way to me as well. I'm speaking the things that I'm supposed to say, but I'm taking so long to do it that I'm commanding the stage for myself. So I'm going to make it problematic for you. I'm going to make it difficult. Mm. So I don't think it's, I don't think it's ever been easy. I don't think it's easy. I, I, I but, think we still like this Shakespeare's comedies move towards those romantic conclusions. Yes. And what he does in all of them is he tries to figure out a different hurdle 
what's going to make these relationships difficult? Is it because these people obviously love each other, but they're having a spat? Is it because yeah. they don't recognize? There's, there's always he's always coming up with some sort of variation on that theme to make the romance difficult, or else the play is over. Act one, scene yeah, two. Yeah, there's got to be a tension. Yeah, right. and usually it's the wit witticisms, like something that's sharp and you know yeah. clever. Yeah, right? it all feels so good. Even at the end, you know, Hero and Claudio, you're going, what's she doing with that guy? You know, end of Midsummer Night's Dream, one of them's still drugged. Yeah. You know, it's. Yeah. it's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's always something, something yeah. at the end of the play to make you go, hmm. <laughs> yeah, I, don't I know, know about I know. that. I and know. so, so I mean, there's, there's a reason why they're called problem comedies because they're the problems are there throughout, but and they're never. This has never been this considered is, a problem play. I don't think yeah. it has been. It's just called yeah. a problem comedy. No, this isn't one of the problem <laughs> okay. comedies. But they, I think they all are. <laughs> 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 Um, maybe it's time to turn this over to the audience and ask some yes. questions. Yes. I get <laughs> Just so everyone can hear. Thank you. Uh, and, and, and thank you to the panel. Uh, some, some terrific stuff I'll be thinking about for a great long time. What I want to hear now, if you would, uh, could you t talk about the choice to set the thing in the American West? <laughs> well, there was a production set in the American West in at Bard in 2007, and it was uh, very successful. Um, and it, it sort of it was an I guess because in that era, female male female roles and the expectation of of women um, really really fit well with with Shrew that you have to find a, a time period where women are expected to become wives and to not become a wife is a rebellion against the status quo. So you can, you can sort of select any number of eras, probably it's difficult to do it now, I think. But, um, but the Western had really, it, it had really been a very fun in 2007. It had released a lot of uh, iconic imagery and iconic scenes that the audience really enjoyed. And Christopher loved that genre very, very much. And he wondered if the Western could come back. So we brought the, he, yeah, and he was actually in it. He played, he played a train conductor. And if you ask him, he'll do, oh yeah. It was, and he was the pedant. And he likes to do his pedant uh, <laughs> Act from the from that west. So so we brought the western back because that was something that he uh, thought had worked really well for audiences. And then, but with, and we brought the the original composition back um, that went along with that. And then we we had permission and thank Bard for this very very much to then do. <laughs> <laughs> whatever we wanted to do with it inside of that genre. And, and I do think it's very important here to recognize Bard on the Beach as a company that has supported, in this case, that, you know, bending of the, of the, of the original script, um, cutting things, you know, you say that how, you know how much we cut and changed, but we were able to do that because we were inside of this home company, our home company here, and they, they allowed us to do this experiment, and and we, I never, I never forget that, because that's not often the case that you're going to be able to work for a Shakespeare company that says, try it, go for it, take the experiment and run, and let's see what happens, and hopefully we get an audience that wants to come every night and see it, too. <laughs> and it's, and that has happened. But um, so that that explains a little bit about where the western came from. Can I just point out too that there have been uh, through the 20th century a lot of productions of this play that have set it as a western. And, uh, That's right. And go back to, there's a silent film from 1911 called The Cowboy and the Shrew, based on this. Oh, hilarious. Yeah. Oh, I gotta watch that. Here you go. <laughs> Criticism of this play um, does go back to George Bernard Shaw, who hated it. Oh. <laughs> and he recommended it be struck from the canon. <laughs> And I sort of agree. I mean, <laughs> what is the point of doing this? Why do you bend over backwards to try to redeem what is mm. essentially a disgusting patriarchal play? Oh. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
that's a good question. We did bend over backwards, and, and you can hear that. You can hear that as you sit. You can hear all the things uh, that we bent and cut and moved and reassigned. Uh, audiences love it. They're coming out in droves. They're responding to it, not only the humor of it, but there's something that hits the heart of, I guess, human relationships, male-female relationships. I mean, I can only speak to this production. And it's about an underdog in our version who fights through to the end to be who she is, and she gets to be who she wants to be. And I think there's a lot of us who want to experience that and who have been repressed a lot, like Kate, and to what, what we attempted. I agree, it's very difficult to play, a uh, play to do without adapting but and setting Kate free. We don't want her to be repressed. Audiences seem to love Petruchio and Kate. It's a couple. They're a couple. They're a couple. That it's like Romeo and Juliet, Petruchio and Kate. Audiences are drawn to them, which means that Shakespeare has written them in such a way that they are charismatic, vivacious, um, they're, uh, scrappy. There's something about that couple that uh, that that people want to come out and watch their story, no matter how you do it, I would say. I can say from a teacher's perspective, too, that, uh, that every year I ask my students when I teach this play, and I don't teach it every year, but I teach it a lot, I say, you know, is this a hateful play? And they are like, yeah. And then I say, should I stop teaching it? And they say, no. <laughs> and so, and I, I, uh, probably the best teaching experience of my career was teaching this play the day the hashtag Me Too story broke. Mm. And, we had, it was the most difficult discussion I have ever had in a classroom. You don't really tend to have all that many difficult discussions in a Shakespeare classroom. But it was the most difficult discussion I've ever had in a classroom. It's by far the best teaching experience I've ever had. So I'm like, yay, let's teach this play because it makes us have conversations like this one. And also, I mean, if we, if we stop reading literature that because of changes in historical culture have, presents values that we find personally repugnant, we're not reading much written before 1950. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it is, yeah, right. not even. A yeah. question for <laughs> Professor Boudra and a comment. Yes. I wanted to ask you what that red book is that you brought oh. and oh. why you brought it. And then my <laughs> comment quickly is that this is the most decades we've been coming and my kids have been coming for one decade. And this was the most entertaining play I have ever seen. And my son says, no, Hamlet was better. I said, well, perhaps it was better, but this was more fun. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I've almost got my 21-year-old uh, neighbor's son coming, and his father doesn't like Shakespeare. And I got him to say the other day, well, I said, well, it's too late for you, Bronson, but maybe not for Aiden. And he said, it's never too late, Holly. So anyway, thank you. I, I brought a copy of the play. <laughs> <laughs> Just because my memory's not that good enough, I had to look something up or I was stumped. <laughs> my little uh, life uh, preserver. I have one in my backpack. I brought so. mine too. <laughs> I, 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 I thought I'd better get the recut one as well, but I, just to compare. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> Hi, um, I just had a question about um, a motive that I noticed throughout the play is the recent understanding of gender performativity. And it's definitely worked into the play about how you see some of the characters, um, especially the older male characters, even given a woman's hat, they immediately have to take it off and throw it away and give, or give it to a woman. Or like, yeah, um, so these kind of choices of wearing suspenders and um, like, what, what, if you could speak more about that. What was the hat? Um, there's this one moment, I'm not sure, but um, um, someone gives a hat to the, to the actor who plays the father later, the actual father, and he immediately takes it off and it's gives it mayor. to the girl. Is it when Petruchio gives his bonnet in the wedding scene oh, to someone and they yeah. throw it off? And even when, she, when Kate comes again and is wearing suspenders, and this definite bending oh. of gender oh, performance. Oh, yes, yes, okay. Right. Yes, yeah. so so, there, yes, there is a story. Yes. Do you want to talk yeah. about? No, you go ahead. What? Well, um, we can talk together, but I'll, we can talk about Kate. <laughs> we'll I, talk right at the same time. Right? I, 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 I was just going to. I was right. just going <laughs> to. <laughs> <laughs> Don't. I would. <laughs> um, 
I'm not going to talk about the hat moment. That's, I think, just a silly bit of business. I don't think it was about, uh, I don't think it was a gender comment. I think it was just a silly bit of business. But I, I will say that with the costume designer and with Jen, we talk a lot about how costumes reflect Kate in this production, her journey towards uh, her claiming her identity. And we talk, so we uh, designed the first dress to be, I don't know if this is actually, if it's covered in buttons and to be quite tight and constricting. So. Uh, that time, Victorian fashion um, was uh, was putting women in very constrained uh, clothing. And what did that do? How was that reflected in the expectation of the woman that she was therefore supposed to live in, in mostly inside in the home and uh, be restrained in her in her exclamations and her activities. So the costumes definitely reflect her journey. And we talked about where, and we, we worked this out through rehearsal, where Jen felt she wanted to start putting on a piece of clothing in the camp that felt like what Kate wanted to be wearing, or when she, like what, what the clothing feels like, right? Yeah, yeah. And what she, what she ends up in in the final moment when she takes off the black dress, that, um, She's wearing what she designed, and it's sort of gender fluid, and it's sort of male and sort of very feminine. She, uh, this, she is very feminine and, and masculine at the same time. We sort of that's yeah. And you let me pull that other line about I will be. F uh, uh, do you see a woman may be made a fool if she had not a spirit to resist? And we pulled that out of that wedding scene. I mean, I would have done it in both scenes, but yeah. I felt. By showing myself yeah. to Bianca and everybody after I'd said that monologue, to say, "Look, you idiots! You don't have to be this. You know, try be who you are. You know, this is what I am, and I will be free even to the uttermost as I please." I kind of mm -hmm. pulled that from out of that other camp scene too. Mm -hmm. And by going to this camp where there was no cabin, no house, where is Petruchio's? What, what the hell did I marry? <laughs> but these cowboys are beautiful, and they're free, and they're not servants of his. And I, you know, I just kind of, that life was, is very, um, Kate adapts to that and takes that on. And you allowed me just to grab a pair of pants yeah. and get out of that dirty dress. Yeah, we sort of had a clothesline <laughs> in, the, in the rehearsal room, and we put clothes on together. And Jen found where she wanted, where her Kate wanted to choose those pieces. And when the hat went on, and when the coat went on, on and, and it was about, um, uh, you know, is the jay more precious than the lark because his feathers are more beautiful? Or is the adder better than the eel because her painted yeah. skin contents the eye? No, my husband. Neither are we the worse for this poor furniture and mean array. Therefore, frolic. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know? Yeah. Let's just be who we are. Let's frolic as we are. This is good enough. Does that answer your yeah. question a bit? <laughs> So I had a question about your decisions for Bianca, because I almost felt, and I really enjoyed the production, but I almost felt that Bianca was sacrificed to an extent. She was made a vacuous stereotype um, to counterbalance Kate's uh, strength and um, mm -hmm. independence. Mm -hmm. So I'd just like you to talk a little bit more about that because that's the one character I found myself being mm -hmm. disappointed in. Mm -hmm. I loved Kate's mother, you know, her transition of her father into her mother, and I thought that that was, you know, a really believable, strong, confident matriarch, mm -hmm. but I was just curious about your decisions around Bianca. Mm -hmm. Um, what we talked about, Kate Besworth plays Bianca, is that uh, Bianca is not, she's not, she's intelligent. And uh, she, she had to find that line. Uh, when she got too uh, silly, uh, she became stupid. And Bianca's not stupid. She knows how to manipulate men and she knows how to get what she wants. Um, but what we wanted to show was that she doesn't have an expectation of her life or of her relationships that is sophisticated. Um, she's a flirt, and she's going to marry the, the, the cutest guy in town. And it's not that she doesn't have that capacity, but she hasn't take, she's, she's not going down that road. And possibly, possibly, her older sister will inspire her at the end of the play, if we go to part two. Possibly Bianca will see, oh, there, there is a, a model here of a more complex relationship uh, in this production. Um, Bianca is, because she's intelligent, she may find her way down that path. But at the moment, she was more like, uh, um, 
Baptista was more like Mrs. Bennett in Pride and Prejudice. Mm -hmm. And Bianca is more like, what's her name? I can't remember her. Lydia. Lydia. Yeah. She, just, she just hasn't thought. She's not conceiving more for herself yet. And if I may, in a way, I, it felt you were trying to push Kate's story. Therefore, there, well, I guess sacrifice is not the right word, but the town became an entity. So those, those folks had to sacrifice a lot of humanity. And I remember the room, it, it was confused because they had to come out and, and laugh a lot at me. And you know, sometimes I would get emotional in rehearsals and things would stop and they say, I feel badly. Lois, I can't, this doesn't feel right, but Lois, you were adamant that the town needed to be relentless in their inhumanity at mm -hmm. times. So, you know, mm -hmm. I, I know that you were, a lot of those conversations were having with, you were having with actors. Mm -hmm. It was interesting. And, and it comes up in Bianca and some of these characters. Yeah. Have you seen a production, a different uh, production of Shrew where you found Bianca? Well, she's played a little more sort of straight, yeah. But a, a bit more earnest and... Uh, yeah, a little more earnest, dutiful, you know, a bit more according to the text. I have. Um, I just felt that she could have been accorded a little more dignity, that's all, mm -hmm. with the production. Right. <laughs> Maybe that's a choice, yeah. Good to, good to hear. Mm, more? Or? Yeah. It, it, what are we at now? Yeah, um, two more, please. One of the things that I thought I saw and I really liked, but I'm not sure whether it was just a figment of my imagination, was it <laughs> looked like it was Kate's idea to do that last thing where he calls all, all of the men, call in their wives and, and the others don't come. It looked like there was just that moment when she was suggesting to him that he do that. And I just, I'd like to know whether that was just my imagination or whether that was really there. <laughs> there's definitely, um, there's a scene where I'm in the town, they call me shrew, I'm gonna beat somebody up. Petruchio says, let's go home, Kate. And then I turn around as they're calling me shrew and I say, they keep calling me shrew and I have, I see the dress and I have this idea, let's go back into that party and take them for all they got, and show them who they are, and then show them who we are. So when we get into the party, uh, yeah, there's plans in play, <laughs> definitely. Yeah, we don't have them all very clear, but we're a team, Grumio, Petruchio, and Kate. Yeah. Got somebody up here. <laughs> Um, it sounds like you've really tried to flip the narrative with this sort of remodel of the play. And with the flipping of the narrative, do you feel like that the real taming in your rewriting was of Petruchio? Do you feel like you oh. sort of tamed him from that perspective rather than um, at, while empowering Kate, do you feel like you Tame Patricio, and he's the real true, and that kind of toxic masculinity was the true tamed. No, I don't. I think we just. I kind of love that, but I, mean, I just no, never no, even no, thought that. I'm sorry. No, I don't think so. But that's awesome. You know, honestly, <laughs> if you see that, then that's. That's fine. But I, I, yeah, I not, never thought not, of that. It's it's not intentional. I'm excited. But I would say we never focused on the word taming. We just didn't tell a story of taming any. Nobody's tamed except maybe the town is tamed to shut up and stop being so cruel. But we just didn't focus on the word taming. And it's right there in the title. And mm. I knew we were avoiding it. <laughs> and I, I, I wondered if we could remove it. Very and just. But that's a really interesting way of looking at it. And I, and I think that's. But he is. Who, uh, he knew who he was when he walked in that, that room. I don't eh? think he is. Tamed. I think he. I think he learns about this woman, and he he learns to he learns to to see her and to listen to her, uh, and he he begins to comprehend her. I think it's more about that. It's about sort of miscommunication and then tr exhausted miscommunication and then kind of staring at each other and sort of kind of 
darling, and then miscommunication, <sighs> right? But you're attracted to, they're attracted to each other and they're in love with each other, but they're just kind of not. And uh, I think, I don't think she tames him. I think that she is a challenge for him. And he, I think he cracks her humor. I mean, and that's the trick for them. So he, yeah, it, it, yeah, I guess I don't tame it. We just didn't use that word, but you know, maybe it's filtered through that way and bubbled that way. Let's but tell, yeah. Don't tell Andrew that he's not no, like that at all. No, but he is definitely, you know, I do remember in those last scenes, um, uh, Lois always said, if, the, if someone's going to throw the lasso, it's going to be Kate. If someone's going to shoot the gun, it's going to be Kate, you know, like, because all the guys were like, I want to <laughs> let me shoot. Yeah. And you were pretty adamant that it was going to be me. Yeah. So everybody back off, calm down, gentlemen. <laughs> you know, and so in a weird way, I guess it was just you giving Kate agency, a lot more agency and letting... Um, Petruchio witnessed that. He witnesses, yes, he witnesses her. He stands there and he watches her. With love. Yeah. And he vibe. wants her to win. <laughs> so I don't know if that's taming or if it's just, he learns to support her, I would say. But there's that line when, when Kate is giving the townspeople all this hell and he turns to her and he says, that's my wife. That's right. <laughs> That's right, he's proud. <laughs> That's when like, you realize they yeah. really get each other. Yeah, oh. you know what? <laughs> it's turned into such a good line, that line. I, that we didn't know that that was such a good line. He gets a laugh on that and line. And just brilliant. And, but when I he mean, first did it, and he got the first laugh, which was a long time ago, he didn't know that that... That's, <laughs> that's right, it surprised him. He was him. like, why are they laughing at this line? Why are they laughing at this line? And then I th he's learnt that the audience is, 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 yeah, has some insight into the whole relationship with that line. Okay, well, I, th I think that we're going to have to wrap things up now. Oh. So um, what I'd like to do is ask you to join me in thanking my co-panelists <laughs> for uh, insightful conversation. <laughs> Thank you. And also to Mary, who organized this for us and invited us all to be here today. It's such a delightful thing to be able to do. So thank you, Mary, as well. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you.